Hello. It's very easy to talk about technology because most of us in some way or other are involved in making it, buying it, selling it, consuming it. But I want to step back a little bit and see if there's another way to look at technology other than the idea that there's just one thing after another. So we tend to think of technology as anything that was invented after we were born. Uh, but obviously, most of what we're surrounded by is more than just that. Or maybe it's technology that doesn't work yet, which is another definition. Or maybe it's all the stuff that's in our pockets, you know, cell phones and things like that. Anything with an off and on switch, perhaps. Um, but if these two things, you can imagine, one was a prehistoric tool that was made that anybody here could probably make, and the other one is this thing that nobody here can make. In fact, all of us here probably couldn't make it. It's uh, a technology that actually requires um, thousands of other intermediate technologies to, to, to make it and keep it going. And maybe even those thousands have hundreds of uh, sub-technologies below. So it's actually um, a representative not of something that stands alone, but of a, of a kind of an ecosystem of technologies, uh, or maybe a superorganism of technologies. And I give that name to that thing, that all these codependent, interrelated, uh, self-sustaining uh, network of technologies, I give it the name of Technium. To, to distinguish it from technology in general. Because when we have a system of things, two things happen. One of them is that uh, the whole thing has a behavior that none of the parts have. So in the same way that uh, a bee um, has a certain behavior, and a beehive has a behavior that, that's not found in the bee. I mean, you can dissect the bee all you want. You're never going to find the behavior of the hive. And so in the same sense, um, the technium as a whole exhibits behavior you're not going to find in your, in your iPhone or, or uh, some electrical wires or a vacuum cleaner. And so I'm interested in that whole system it's in the same way that the ecosystem as a whole has a certain behavior. And one of the things we know about systems like that is that besides the fact that they have behaviors that the parts don't have, they also always exhibit, whether they're man-made or natural, they always exhibit um, emergent tendencies. They, they have biases. They want to lean in certain directions. They, they have what I would call wants. And of course, by wants, I don't mean intelligent. I don't mean conscious. I mean wants in the way they say a plant wants light. It's leaning in that direction. So the question I want to ask is what technology wants? And I begin with the plants because I think that the technium is in some ways an extension of the same evolutionary forces that produced us. Okay, and so I would say, what does evolution want? And of course, this is kind of a, a slightly um, heretical thing in biology. There's, there's the orthodoxy is that evolution doesn't want anything. There's no direction, that it has no trajectories, that it's completely contingent. But there's actually a minority view of some evolutionary biologists who suggest, in fact, our intuitive sense that there is increasing complexity in the world is true. And therefore, we can actually begin to, you know, to look at what the technology wants. I mean, we, we see you know, 3.7 billion years of evolution, and there's a move towards greater complexity. Now, of course, if you start off simply, you have only one direction you can go. So looking at the leading edge of, of life and seeing it more complex doesn't really tell us much. It's really, what does the trailing edge look like? Once you're halfway complex, you can become simpler. And in truth, what ha that rarely happens on average in biology. Generally, things become more complex even when they have a chance to become simpler. So they also become more diverse, more complicated, more variety. And um, I think we, we can make a list of the kind of general long-term trends in biology and their increasing diversity, increasing specialization, increasing mutualism, codependent upon each other, increasing ubiquity, and there's increasing mindfulness. The, 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 the origin of learning of, of, of organisms that adapt occurs throughout all taxon. And there's increased evolvability, which is a key idea. The idea that evolution itself is evolving, that the ability to evolve is actually evolving, that, the, uh, uh, that serves the degrees of freedom, the, the, the space in which an early primitive organism could evolve is very small. When you invent sexual recombination, you suddenly have made it easier to evolve. And so we see, over again, 3.7 billion years of evolution, the evolvability of organisms increasing. So that would be fine for evolution, but I'm 
interested in this uh, remarkable awareness, awakening, that we had maybe about 50 years ago when we learned or discovered that the essence of life was not in wet tissue, but in fact was in the information. The discovery of the genetic code, we saw that, hey, uh, the essence of life is actually in the information processing. And the, the information processing has happened not just within an individual cell, but throughout evolution. And once we understood that it was actually kind of a lot of information, we understood that, hey, that's what machines do, that's what computers do. Maybe there's an equivalency. In fact, one of the things that has happened recently is that scientists took the Darwinian, neo-Darwinian process of natural selection and moved it in to computer system. And so some of the, if you're using Microsoft Word, some of that program was actually evolved. And by the same token, scientists have done experiments, proof of concepts, where they've taken E. coli, assigned little numbers to the different genes, and used the, the massive amount of E. coli as a kind of parallel processing computer to solve canonical computer problems like the traveling salesman program, showing, in fact, that there's a equivalency often between the living and the born. I mean, the born and the made, between living and mechanical worlds. So that the distinction is not as great as we think it is. In fact, there is a continuum between them because they are basically all eventually information based. So that, I think, gives us permission to ask what does technology want and to see that, in first, that it's in some ways an extension of what <laughs> evolution wants. Now, again, when I say want, I'm not thinking about an intelligent, conscious awareness want, but the want that this robot, which is in Willow Garage in Stanford, I think it's called T2, it has been programmed to find its own power. And so what it does is it actually um, roams around through the building looking for an outlet, and when it sees one, it takes its tail. Oh, don't turn around, don't turn around. Okay. It, 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 it takes its tail, and it plugs itself in. And I had the, the, the opportunity to stand between it and its plug. And I could feel that it really, really wanted that electricity. Again, it was not conscious, but it, was, it wanted it in a way that maybe a grasshopper wants uh, its food. So if we ask what evolution wants, we get these answers very similar. I mean, what technology wants. It's, you know, what technology wants in the long term is basically the same thing that life wants, which is it's moving towards, it's headed towards, there's a drift, there's a bias towards increasing complexity, diversity, specialization, ubiquity, sentience, and evolvability. In fact, that's what we see. Technology is basically increasing or amplifying or accelerating the ways in which things change. It's actually um, introducing new ways to evolve. Evolution is evolving. The evolvability is, of this whole system is evolving. We see increasing diversity. These are spark catchers from locomotives. Uh, you know, two centuries ago, it's like a little kind of butterflies in a, in, a, in a museum. We see specialization. The same thing we see with cells going from a general cell to a very specialized cell, you get 250 specialized cells in your body, you know, muscle cells, heart muscle cells, brain cells. We have hammers and then we have specialized versions of them. We have a camera and then we have a specialized infrared camera or an underwater camera or an infrared underwater camera. And we see that increasing specialization happen. I'm going to skip that one. But what we understand is that technology has its own biases. We can say it's an agenda, we can say it's an urge. And an example, one of the things that technology wants is more technology. It's, it's also using more of the power to serve itself rather than us. So I calculated that three quarters of the entire power we generate is used by machines, not by us. Like for instance, when you drive your car, most of the energy is used to move the car, not you. You're just a minor component, and then you park in a garage, and maybe you heat the garage for the car. And so there is a sense in which more and more of the of, of the entire technium is machines talking to other machines, machines caring for other machines, machines servicing other machines. And the other kind of long-term trend we see is this idea that most of the inventions of the world happen and are discovered simultaneously, independently, and by often multitudes of more than more than one. And so in fact, um, everyone from the light bulb, which was discovered 23 different times independently, and Edison was sort of the last first inventor of the light bulb, um, 
we find that this is sort of, it, there's no invention that stands alone. It's, it's part of a cluster, an ecology of inventions. And when all the other precursors of inventions are in place, it's almost inevitable that the next adjacent invention takes place. And um, it almost can't be stopped in some ways. So Moore's Law is another example of the a long-term urge or trend tendency in the technium. This is this, um, I guess it's a, a pattern in which computer chips become twice as fast and half as cheap every year. And they were, that's, I mean, they've been doing that on a kind of unwavering straight line when graphed on a log chart uh, beginning in the 60s. But what's interesting is that um, that same kind of law occurs in other domains. Um, in bandwidth, in the growth of performance in hard disks, in, uh, sequencing of genes. There's lots of places in which it happens, and it seems to happen independently of whether people are believing it to happen or not. And so in that sense, one could imagine a different world, a different planet, is going to be governed by the physics of, of, the, uh, of, of well, physics and chemistry of matter. And um, it probably it, it, the slope maybe is dependent on economic Regimes, but basically, this is an urge, a tendency within the technology in itself. So technologies are inevitable, and the web was inevitable. However, that's the genius of the web, the, the, in terms of like a class of things. The species of the web is not inevitable. So the light bulb as a genius was inevitable, but the particular one, whether it used 12 volts or was it AC current or DC current, whether it had tungsten or not, is not inevitable. And the same thing about the web. The web is inevitable, but not what kind of web that we have. That is our choice. We have the choice about whether it's transparent or open, whether it's a government or nonprofit, whether it's um, something that's based on one protocol or another. Those are the kinds of contingencies that are open to us and that we do have choice in, and, and that matter hugely to us. And so there are lots of things that are coming down. Human cloning, it's inevitable. We have the choice of what kind of human cloning we want to do it, in what context, and, and what's the environment. Um, Computer-driven automobiles, they're very inevitable. They're almost here. There's not much choice about whether they're going to come. We have a choice about the infrastructure, uh, the politics around them, and not whether they're going to be here. So I like to think of us as both as self-created, in terms of we've created our humanity, we are both the created and the creator, which brings us into tension with technology forever. Because as both the created and the creator, we are never going to escape the fact that sometimes we are master, and sometimes we are the slave, and that kind of dichotomy is, is going to exist for as long as there is technology, which will be forever, because we are now dependent on it, and we have been from the beginning. One of the first technologies we invented was the external stomach, this idea of cooking outside um, and digesting things that we could not digest on our own, which this new nutrition changed our teeth, changed the shape of our jaw and our enzymes. And so we become dependent on for long-term fertility, but we also changed our bodies. From our minds, changed our bodies, making us the first domesticated animal and making us the first technology. So we saw a incredible uh, explosion of our population very early on, the first population explosion after the invention of language, which allowed us to finally communicate to ourselves as well as to others, and gave us access to our own smartness. We used these with very simple tools. We actually um, settled most of the watersheds in the entire globe at the rate of, of one kilometer per year, I mean, or two kilometers, one mile per year, we settled and, and occupied the entire planet, one of the fastest uh, species takeovers there ever were. And with a very few set of tools, we began to alter the planet. We, the hunter-gatherers, uh, eliminated 250 of the megafaunas on Earth to extinction. 